Awesome. All right, guys. Well, hey, welcome back. And so, uh, you know me, I'm always trying to figure out new ways to be able to do this. The, the reason that we're doing something a little different tonight with the live stream is I want to be able to get a link to share with you guys uh, the week before, the days before we actually do go live, um, just because it's be, it'll be easier for folks to remember that we're actually doing the live stream. But hey, anyway, thanks so much for, uh, for coming back right now. And uh, now we're just going to go straight into the next question. Uh, so, Mandy, what, what's, ne what's next on tap? Next question is, um, how do I stop my Weimaraner from knocking over my one-year-old child? Yeah, you know, these dogs, I'll tell you, we've got quite a history with them. These dogs are pretty big dogs. Uh, they uh, Sometimes they're just really kind of dense at figuring <laughs> out where in the world are the boundaries and they think that every human, including the adults, are their own personal play toy. Now look, I, I hate to throw the breed under the bus. They're actually a really great breed. They're great for hunting, great for a lot of outdoor activities, but they struggle with manners, I've really noticed over the years. Uh, I've, I've met very few Weimariners. Uh, you know, we've trained some that are, that, are pretty, that are pretty well, but I've met a lot of them that are just really, really difficult uh, you know, especially when they start getting to be a year, a year old or two years old, can be a very challenging and difficult breed. So, you know, what can you do? Well, the, the honest answer is just start training today. You know, if your dog is knocking, if, if your Weimaraner is knocking over your one-year-old, they probably don't really know the role of, I must be calm inside the home. Uh, I have two German Shepherds. It won't be long before I have three German Shepherds running around uh, my house. And just having calmness inside the house um, at, at for young dogs is really very important. I think my dogs have sped up over the years, but in the beginning, I think it's, it's important to teach them how to be calm. So how do you actually go about teaching a Weimaraner to be calm? Well, it all actually starts first with having a leash on the dog. Uh, one of the mental hurdles that people I'm constantly pushing up against for people to understand that I just don't want them, that I want them to get over is keep a leash on your dog. Like there's all sorts of different leashes, a buckle, you know, buckle leash with a collar, a slip leash with a collar. You can use prong collars. You can use remote collars. For me, I personally love having the slip leash on dogs that are in the process of getting trained because it just makes it very easy. Now you might say, Hey Al, what if my dog is going to get you know, tangled up and tangled up in something. Well, that's what you're there for. You're there to save the dog from, you know, getting tangled. But having that leash on there, when you actually start talking to the dog about not running into your baby and actually becoming calm in your presence is really the beginning of how you're going to do that. Now, I'll give you a couple other steps. So step one, get a leash on that dog. Step two, no more bowl feeding for your dog that's running around your house, knocking over your children and disrespecting you. And then step number three is start place training immediately. Hey, do you think it's possible to throw up a link for one of our place training? Uh, yeah, well, no, nah, well, not going to be so easy. Yeah, it's not going to be so easy that I way. I can maybe do it from here. Yeah, uh, throw up a link. Yeah. Throw up a link oh, for yeah. uh, for place training. But place training is the way that I actually start every single one of my clients. So if, if your dog is knocking over your children, place training is the is the way to go. Now, the tip number four after have a leash, no more food in the bowl, start your place training. Tip number four is going to be don't treat it like a trick do it like it's going out of style. You want to make sure that the dog understands that their whole life inside your home revolves around being calm, okay, and staying on their place until you release them. That is some really, really powerful stuff right there. We've seen such huge transformations in families just through place training. Even though there's so many other things you can treat, teach your dog, this one skill is really going to be a, a life changer for you. So, hey, really recommend doing that. Um, if you have any more questions about, you know, your dog knocking over your children, you know, hey, you know, I just thought of one more thing. If you're doing all of that and your dog's still knocking over your children, then it's definitely time to have a conversation and to be pretty firm with your dog at the moment that it happens. 
I want you to use the leash in the beginning to prevent the dog from actually knocking over your children and telling them where to go. But if your dog is still, you know, you're hand feeding the dog, you're using the leash, you're doing place training, you're treating it, you're treating the dog's training like it's a lifestyle, not like a trick, and your dog still chooses and do that, it's time to really correct the dog and let it know in no uncertain terms that, hey, we're, you're not allowed to knock over anybody for that matter, okay? All right, I'm gonna let Mandy. I'm gonna let Mandy continue there. I'm gonna pull. Well, up. I got one you posted. Got I was just gonna post the VR one too. Okay, yeah. What? So let's. Uh, yeah, I'll go ahead and get, I'll grab the. I'll grab the next question. I think I got it on here. Okay. Yeah. So the next question that that's in our list is why should I let my dog make mistakes instead of saying stay? So if you've been watching any of my videos for any amount of time, when we're working dogs on play stays, down stays, sit stays, you're going to notice that I actually don't ever say the word stay to the dog. And the reason that I'm not saying stay is because I don't want, I don't want to threaten the dog. Okay. That's not the type of relationship that I want to build with a dog. If you're saying stay, it's okay. I prefer not to say stay. However, I want that when I put the dog into any kind of stay, place, down, or sit, that I actually give them the choice to actually break the stay. Because if they, if they break the stay and I'm prepared, then I get to teach them that I didn't want them to do it. Now, if you're not prepared and your dog's stay is pretty iffy, saying stay and pointing your finger at them could help give you a little bit of an edge to make sure that they hold the stay. But I much prefer over several weeks, if not months, of allowing my dog the choice of either continuing to stay or to break their stay, so that way I can teach them the difference between those two decisions. Let me get kind of practical for a second. For any of you guys that are currently training with us or following any of our, uh, any of our you know, hundreds of dog training videos that we're posting, when you put your dog on its place, each time that you do that and you, you know, using your leash, you put the dog onto its place, I want you to step back about two feet while you're still holding on to the end of the leash and it's slack. It's a little tricky because I want you to leave the leash slack. So the dog's on their place, maybe they're sitting and they're thinking about coming off. Instead of stopping the dog from com coming off, I would bait the dog by kneeling down, having them step off the bed, just for the purpose of grabbing the leash and putting them all the way back on. And I would keep doing that until the dog decided not to come off. And then at that moment, that's when I'm gonna deploy reward. And I'm gonna make it very clear to the dog that coming off when I kneel down on the ground or do something like that is gonna get the leash to tighten up and I'm not gonna give you any kind of reward but the moment that you actually actively choose to stay on the bed or stay in your stay, whether it be sit or down or place, then that's what I'm actually gonna go about rewarding. So I think that's gonna be really important for any of you guys. So why should I let my dog make mistakes? So that way you have the opportunity to teach them the differences of your choices. That's really what I want you to get out of this. Okay. Yeah. So there we go. Mm -hmm. What's next? That was pretty good. Um, well, when should I introduce remote collar training to my dog? So, you know, remote collars are really a fantastic tool. And I actually had a family earlier today that they had, well, earlier this week, they had actually asked me like, hey, you know, we, we understand that we have this high anxiety dog and we really want to do a little bit of remote collar training before we actually start training the basics. Okay. And so then here's actually what I explained to them. I told them that, look, if you're going to do remote collar training prior to that, it's really going to mess the dog up. Because here's what really what you're supposed to do. You need to actually use a leash and the, and the dog's food mm -hmm. to teach it the skills. Now, let me just go over what are the three basic skills that every dog should learn? Well, in my opinion, the place stay, loose leash walking, and turning around and coming back. Mm -hmm. And you should actively be teaching those with a leash and the dog's meals. So once you've actually, let's just say that you're watching some of our training videos, any of our virtual reality videos, you're watching those, 
you're doing the training program and you've gone two week ball game mm -hmm. or hey we're gonna go for a dance in the neighborhood that I'm gonna have to follow you or hey I know that when you guys are drinking coffee in the morning that I'm supposed to stay on my place mm -hmm. once you are actually got your dog going there that's actually when you're going to introduce the remote collar you wouldn't actually introduce it to the dog before when they knew nothing you would introduce the remote collar to the dog when they already knew what to do so you could associate it and then what would you be trying to get rid of mandy what do you think what tool if the remote collar is a pressure tool mm -hmm. what basic pressure tool are you trying to get rid of when you start doing remote collar training any the, guesses the leash, the leash. You, sh you still need it in the beginning what we recommend to people is when they first start training with remote collar that you find your working level we've got videos covering that you find the working level and then you press and hold the button you tell the dog what to do and then if they don't get it as you're holding the button then you guide them with the leash to accomplish the thing that they want because you know they might feel the button and even though it's low level it might feel weird and they may yeah. not know what it means it could be like you know a mosquito on your neck and you're like yeah. even though it's light you don't necessarily know what it means mm -hmm. so if you go and you touch the dog and you tell them the thing and they're a little confused help your dog out with a leash and then when they actually get to do the thing you want reward them well mm -hmm. I actually think I'm gonna do something different this week in the way that I've been training and I actually I actually think that it's going to improve my training to some degree so I want you to push the button. I want you to well, I want you to have the leash in your hand. Push the button. Get the dog to do the thing that you've already trained it to do. And when they do that, let go of the button and then reward the dog particularly well. So the answer is the, so the question was, when do I or when do we actually introduce remote collar training to a dog? After the dog already understands the fundamentals of that skill. And once they do that, we'll incorporate it in, and then that's going to actually speed up the uh, speed up the process. And then from there, of course, there is ways to actually begin to get rid of the remote collar because the goal is just to talk and to gesture to the dog because that's what humans want to do. I don't want you to perpetually have a leash of food and a remote collar. You need to get rid of those things, but you got to train consistently and diligently to be able to get rid of those tools. Okay. So is it always, but it's obviously not always, do some dogs need that remote collar and do some dogs You know, like there's, a, like there's another dog trainer that I follow quite a bit and I like his answer because I was kind of, I was kind of the, the train of thought that I'm going to, like, I want to get all the tools off my dog. Mm -hmm. It's okay. <laughs> I, just spit, I just spit all okay. over Mandy, so. No, it went right here, yeah. Here. Well, I okay. saw a drop. Land right there, but anyway, and so um, this other tra I was the like, trainer. Yes, yeah, so this you other want trainer. To get all the for your dog. Okay, so this other trainer, you know, so this other trainer. Okay, so the way that I go about it, guys, is I want to get all the tools off of my dog, and I think as I as I've been thinking about this over the years, the reason I want to do that is because we compete, mm -hmm. and I can't have any of those tools on my dog whenever go in the field. So I feel like, well, if I can't have them when I go and compete, then nobody should get to have those tools, period. Mm. And I'm yeah. wrong. And I'm wrong in that, you know, because as I've been thinking about this, look, some dogs might need a remote collar for a long time. And if, 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 you're, if you're somebody that's training with any one of these really powerful tools and you know that you can't come off of it, it's okay. You're gonna get judged by people if, you, if your dog is going around town with a remote collar, and I'm just gonna tell you why, I don't really care anymore about any, about any judgment from anybody else because they don't know me and they don't know my dog and they don't know you and they don't know your dog. They don't know all the work that you've put in to train that dog that you have to save its life, to give it the best life possible. So like I've kind of had a little bit of a paradigm shift here when it comes to tools. I really feel that, you know, that some dogs need to have remote collars on at all times because they have a propensity to be aggressive and yes we train them and we and we get them out of the most dangerous stuff a whole bunch of the time but how about if you just want to set the peace of mind of knowing that if my dog makes a bad decision that i can give them clarity in the moment to say that that's not ever acceptable for you to be able to do mm -hmm. 
what, so this dog trainer, the thing that he said is that he thinks that the, uh, that the remote collar is like a seatbelt. Now, I'm going to knock on wood real quick. I haven't been in a car accident in a long time, but I still but, put yeah. my, my seatbelt on. And I don't put it on because of the cops. I put it on because I want to come back home. You know, I want to come back home and I want to survive any kind of crash because who knows when the next accident, when the next unfortunate thing is going to come in your life. Nobody knows that. Nobody can predict past this very moment right now if you're going to get, continue to live. So having those tools there to give you the peace of mind, to be able to go out and to live your life with your dog and still practice diligently is what I recommend now. But know your dog. Like, for some of you guys don't know, we had, I had Channel 11 over here at the house. We're filming, some, they filmed something. Our, we have a story airing on the news in a couple of weeks. But I took all the tools off of Gabby because I wanted to see what she could do when the news was going. She was naked, so to speak, and man, she did awesome. I was so, so impressed with, with her. So, you know, you don't, you, I keep the tool there if I need it. But I also train diligently enough that I can say, I know that my dog doesn't need it anymore. But if you, if, if you need it, you need it. And keep it there. And don't care about the judgment of other people if you have to have a prong collar or a remote collar or whatever it takes to have the best relationship with your dog because that's what we owe them. We owe, mm -hmm. we owe the dogs that much. Yeah, I mean, I think the judgment a lot of times just comes from people assuming... That you don't know well, yeah, you know, this either. called a shock collar, and God, who know, who yeah, likes that name? I mean, the shock collar is like the worst marketing name ever. And so, that's true. like, magnitude, Even, yeah. magnitude matters. Mm -hmm. Like, so if you're looking at a remote collar and level one is doesn't even feel like a, a wisp of air, but level 100 feels like the worst Charlie horse that you've ever had, well, yeah. heck, the, it, it stands to reason that there's a whole bunch of levels that might actually be helpful for your dog that actually don't create any right. kind of discomfort. Right. It, it just boggles my mind. And you're like, I get it because I was, I used to be one of those people like, oh, shock collars are evil and they're bad. Well, you can screw them up. You know, humans are capable of doing some pretty rotten stuff. But out of all the species on the planet, we're also capable of doing the best things. Mm -hmm. And so... That's what happens when you put tools into humans' hands, but that doesn't mean that we should ban the tool because some ig some idiot, yeah. you know, is out there zapping his dog on a hundred. That you know, that person should go to jail yeah. for animal abuse. But if you're trying to help an animal, you need to use the minimum effective force. Not the minimum force, the minimum effective force for the dog to understand that this is dangerous and we want you to continue to live. And it's a very important thing for dogs and it's also a very important thing for humans. Mm -hmm. All right, what's next? Um, my dog is peeing and pooping in the house. How do I correct them for doing that? Well, the first thing I want you to do is I want you to go find, go find one of, you know, find a big, thick, newspaper that's the first thing i want you to do and then i want you to whack yourself in the head after you do that do not correct your dog for using the restroom inside your home period don't do it never ever ever even don't. if you catch them in the act it's not okay to, to like let them know that hey that's not good. you can't drop kick them you can't spank them you can't remote collar high level them you can't hit them with a newspaper. You can't stick their face in it. You can't yell at them and tell them what a horrible dog they are. You can't do any of it. Now, is there an exception? There is. Marking. Marking behaviors inside your home. Please correct those. Okay. Don't use a newspaper. Use a tool that, like remote collar, your leash, yell if that works for you. Okay. I yell at times for my dogs because I associate it mm -hmm. to the stuff that they like the least. So if your dog is pooping and peeing inside your home, you don't get to correct them. The first thing that you're going to do is you're going to, you're going to correct yourself is really what needs to happen. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to stop putting food and water on the floor for your dog. 
But if you say, well, hey, I've got like four cats and three other dogs, what am I supposed to do? Well, quit hoarding animals is the first thing. But the second thing is, you know, yeah, quit hoarding animals. But the second thing really is, is look, you know, if you add another animal into your, li- into your life, don't put all the responsibility back onto them for learning where they're supposed to go. You're going to have to take the lead. Now, I'm going to tell you, there's some dogs out there that we've trained with. Ooh, they are tough to potty train. They are challenging. But the correction never makes the habit. Anything, like when it comes to corrections, correcting any behavior, the correction will will 101% of the time not form the habit that you need the dog to form. Corrections and boundaries will never form habits, period. Mm -hmm. The only thing that will actually form the habit of your dog actually using it outside is you putting a leash on the dog or you leading the dog outside when they need to go. They use the restroom and that feels good. And you also tell them how amazing they are for doing outside. And then if you multiply that by 786 times in a row, you know, whatever, whatever number that happens to be, then your dog is going to understand it. But the opportunity to use the restroom inside your home This is really where you got to be smart about it. This is where your wireframe crate, okay, and management of the dog's food and water are going to work wonders for you. So that way the dog understands like, oh, I don't have any access here. And then when I do get access, they're going to put me inside of this crate. Hey, maybe I don't like it. Maybe I do. But then what the human does for me is the human takes me out to the place they want me to go. And then they tell me how wonderful I am. And that's absolutely what you should do with a dog. Yeah, I mean, the puppy I fostered recently, that really was, it just took one or two times of her pot when she's peeing in the grass. I just was like, hey, good girl. So, and then she was. You know, it's just, you know, it's just one of those things, okay? Like, I get it. Nobody wants, nobody wants the dog to poop or pee inside of their home, okay? And it is difficult. Nobody wants to have a filthy home, and I, and I get that. Let me add something else because just one of my one of my clients that just graduated had a dog uh, that actually had quite a bit of excitement peeing, and uh, and so there, like, what can you do? Well, correcting a dog for excitement peeing is a huge mistake. Yeah. You can't do that because the dog's excited and they the reason really control they it. really can't control themselves. So what you've got to do for the dog is, you know, anticipate the excitement peeing and have the leash well on the do- have the leash on the dog well before the excitement peeing happens, and then one hundred percent for sure, don't touch that dog. Mm-mm. If you if you have a dog that has excitement peeing and you're gonna go and you're gonna even think about touching, they're gonna squirt all over your floor. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's you just can't they just can't help it. You know, Jasmine, Jasmine right here. She had excitement peeing for my brother really? until she was like six or seven. Really? It's not common in large dogs. No, it's not That's... common. But Jasmine, did, mm, Leo, she liked Leo. Leo mm. just had an effect. Uh, had an effect on her, and she would excitement pee well, for that's him. That's gotta be flattering, Leo. Huh? Yeah. So, Leo, are you watching? <laughs> so, all right. So, you know, he's probably not. He's probably drinking beer or something like that right now. My brother, so if anybody's wondering, he's not an alcoholic, but Leo works for a, a local brewery, Spindle Tap Brewery. They make some fantastic beer. If you guys have never been down there, um, yeah, this is a dog training show, but damn, they have some really <laughs> good beer there. So, hey, hey guys, I, I hope everybody's enjoying this. Is anybody even watching or do we have some? Mm-hmm. Hey, thanks guys for, for watching this. If you haven't had a chance, you know what, what you could do for me? Is can you hit that little thumbs up button? Because we really need those to be able to get these get this out to people but you could also if you're watching this just kind of in passing hey have you subscribed to our channel we've got more and more of these videos coming out to really help you raise a happy and reliable dog um you know i've really devoted my life to to training dogs and to and to educating people one of the cool things that i'm doing and man i'm pushing so hard on this front right now is that we're creating written content, uh, talking about how to help your dog. We're creating, you know, video content. We're creating audio content. We're creating virtual reality content 
to be able to help you train your dog. We have stuff on your smart speakers. We have stuff on your television. We're gonna have stuff in your car, you know, hopefully if Mandy and I can ever get this thing figured out because we're, we're kind of struggling soon. a little bit. <laughs> soon, we promise very soon we're gonna have a podcast, guys, but it's just, uh, it's a lot of work, very okay? It is, it is a lot of work, and if not, then, you know, if, if we don't have a podcast in the next month, you might not see Mandy sitting next to me anymore. No, I'm kidding. I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do my job. I could not do this job without Mandy, guys. She is she's awesome. She helps me so much. Really appreciate you for all your awesome work. So, um, but anyway, uh, look, we've got all that content out there. Um, it, it, you know, we put this out there for you. It is a lot. It is a lot of work. We're doing it completely free. I don't want anything in return. But if I could ask for something, and and I, and I don't want it, but if I could ask for anything, is Use the content to help you improve your relationship with your dog. And if, if my content is doing that, would you send me a message and let me know? Because I can't tell you the effect that it has when I look at my inbox and I see an email from somebody in you know, Spokane, Washington, that just told mm-hmm. me that, hey, your, your content is having a huge effect on my family. It's helping us. So if, if this is you, uh, hey, I really appreciate you, but please send me those because those would mean the world to me. But don't do anything else. You don't have to hire us for dog training. I'll be, I'll be more than happy to give you the advice for free. All right, so what's next, Mandy? All right, so should my pregnant wife also be teaching my dog to walk on a leash? He, he walks great for me. What do you think? Uh, well, if it's a hundred pound dog, then it's a hundred and thirty five pound dog. Does he lunge? Does he have like if he has habits lunging and stuff? Well, then... she's a hundred and thirty five pounds, and she's she's sometimes a little spooked by things. I mean, if there's any chance he could pull her down, then I would say it's. But how about if he? How about if she? It's and it's a she the dog in this particular case. How about if she just needs to go use the restroom really bad? Yeah. You know, like, the, I, I guess you guys know the I mean, the, the dog are... should definitely have the same respect for her because he said she wa- he, the dog walks great for him. One of the, one of the common things that I see, and I, I have a kind of a funny answer to this. One of the common things that I see is like, man, my dog really listens so well to my husband, but doesn't respect or value me. And so that's really common. And one of the things I tell people all the time is like, you know, if we send the dog off to training, will the dog listen to us? And then I ask the people, will you go outside and wash my car? And then they look at me like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, you're not going to wash my car, even though you understood what I said, right? And they're like, well, yeah, you're right. It says, well, it's the same thing with your dog. Why is your dog going to do any of the things, any of the things that you want it to do? And then maybe they even understand it if there's no relationship there to be able to tell the dog that, hey, you know. So there has to be a relationship there for your dog to listen. And like if you're pregnant and you have any dog, um, you should be training that dog on how to walk on a slack leash. Please be careful. Okay. Start off inside your home teaching the dog how to respect the leash. But also you know, really triple down on showing the dog how important it is to be on the left-hand side of your body. You know, we've really put out a couple of videos this week, and there's there's obviously some on, on this channel um, of us showing you how to start the dog and feeding them for being on your left, but teaching them that first, and then teaching them that you're going to have to watch me when I have a leash in my hand to understand how I'm going to move is real important. So I don't want to really, this is kind of an aside, but I think it's important to, to mention, okay? Teaching your dog how to walk on a leash is, is, about atten- is about attention, but it's not about the dog listening to you. It's about the dog watching you. And so when you first go walking with your dog, you really want the dog to understand that they should turn, they should move straight with you. They should turn right with you. They should turn left with you and they should stop. So I'm going to give you just a little pointer right here. If you go watch the video on Facebook that I posted yesterday, at one part of the video, you're going to see my hand across my stomach. 
and I'm holding it kind of, you know, I'm holding my hand kind of like this. Let's see if I can see it there. And it's about 30 second delay. So you're going to see my hand like this, okay, across my stomach. And really what I'm trying to emphasize to my client right there is here's the boundary. Here's the front of my body. Here's the boundary. And if I see the dog exceed that boundary, the, their shoulder get past that boundary, I'm immediately going to make a choice to turn right, to turn left, or I'm going to sit them. But they're not going to get to continue to walk forward. Mm -hmm. And the reason that that works as a form of punishment is your dog wants to continue to move forward. And if you change directions each time they get in front of you, you take that ability to, away and then they stop to move past you because it doesn't work. So that is one thing that you can do. I'm going to shoot a lot more videos on that and go into a lot of detail about how to actually start walking with your dog. Got some great plans for that here in the next few weeks. But just know if you're going to start walking your dog and you're pregnant, go very silent, put a leash into your hand, hold the minimum amount of leash that you can put in your hand, and then start moving and not talking. And every time the dog crosses the front of your body, walk away from the dog. And you're going to begin to see that the dog is going to begin to respond to you much better. So yes, mm -hmm. if you're pregnant and your dog already knows how to walk well for your husband, please, please, please also train your dog and it should be much faster for you too. Okay, let's do, let's do one more question and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Okay. Um, yeah, pick, pick one that's, what do you, what do you have? So well, okay, pick something well, that you like. Uh, my dog is... Ruining my daycare business. He's going, I guess it's a doggy daycare. Yeah, it's He's a doggy going after other dogs that are in my care. What can I do? You know, it's tough. It's tough. You know, if you're, if you're running a dog daycare business and your own personal dog is, is out of control, um, and I wouldn't necessarily out of control, but maybe just going after dogs, it can be really hard. So this is where place training really comes in. But beyond that, I'm just going to be real clear. If your dog is going after other dogs that are coming into your household aggressively, the moment that I even think that you're thinking about going after them, I'm going to use whatever that dog likes least in the world on them. Mm -hmm. For their benefit. I'm going to tell them that you are not allowed to go into that state of mind and that when you do the thing that you like least in the world is going to happen. You know, people ask me all the time, well, what does a correction look like? And I says, well, you have to know your dog. You have to know what it actually looks like. We did talk a little bit earlier about minimum effective force. So this is one of the reasons that I like remote callers because I can dial it in and I can use my brain instead of my arm to pop a leash and tell a dog not to do something. But I can use my brain. I can turn the dial on my remote caller. Let, let's see, I should have one here. Here we go. I've got my remote collar right there. I turn it on. And then let's just say that I know that the dog dislikes level 30. Then what I'll do is I'll put it into momentary mode. So got it in momentary mode. It's at 30. And I know that when I push that button, that one individual pulse is going to come out of there. And I know that they're going to dislike that. At the moment they start thinking about becoming aggressive, I've already got a leash on them. I'm going to say no. And then I'm going to begin to tap them with that button to change their mind. If I can't change their mind within two seconds of them starting to think that, I'm going to 40. Okay? And the dog is not supposed to like it. But on the other side of that psychological boundary that you're creating, then the dog then the dog can actually begin to get rewarded for actually being calm in the presence of the dogs that are coming into your daycare business. But that's exactly what I would do. Now, it's a little tricky because if your dog doesn't already know the remote caller, you can't do that. You have to actually go through the process of teaching them at mm -hmm. least one skill. That's why we're so quick to implore people to, hey, please start training the place training if you have an aggressive dog. So that way you can go about and, heck, Start telling them that you're not going to act that way. You can even go play, do place training for three or four days where you have, you know, 75 repetitions of place training in, in those four days. And then you could introduce the remote and say, when I have you on your bed, if you start growling at another dog in my house, I'm not going to have any of that. But that's what I would do. 
Probably you think it's like a territorial thing because it's her dog. Look, I th- just... and I'll just tell like I, I'm thinking about it because I already saw it and I and I dealt with it. I didn't deal with it with a remote collar. I had a slip leash, and the moment that dog growled and that line was in my hand, I told that dog, "You're not going to do that." And then the dog actually spent the next thirty minutes calm in the presence of a dog that it had previously tried to bite. Just but one but okay. And I'm not like the, the strongest dude in the world yet. But anyway, I'm not the strongest dude in the world. The, the thing is, is that as firm as I was on the leash, my client can't generate that amount of force. And I don't want her to. Mm-hmm. So what I want to happen there is I want to deploy a very humane and ethical tool like the remote collar to tell the dog that it's not okay for you to treat the other dogs like this. We're trying to give you the best life. But it's never okay for you to act that way. Mm-hmm. It looks like we've got a couple of questions on there. Well, there are comments. Um, Steven said, lesson one, don't spit on Mandy. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, thanks, Steven. <laughs> and Sandy said, thank you, Al. It was her, in response You're to welcome, question, Sandy. Like, so. you know, we're, I'm thinking about you. And, uh, yeah, if there's anything that I can do, you know, I'm, I, I'd love to help in any way that I can. So... Well, are there anything else? That, is there anything else that you can think of, Mandy? You know that that folks need to know. You know, so mm-hmm. obviously we've got a ton of stuff on Facebook that's that's coming yeah. out. I had to, I had two I had two kind of newish kind of videos come out over the weekend. Did you get to watch them? I know you were a really busy weekend. I did, but I did. Yeah, actually, this. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Was, I watched the. Well, yeah. like at one a.m. or did you watch no, them? No, I can't so. even tell you. Yeah, I saw them both. I saw the okay. other one today. Yeah, we had some kind of newish videos that we're doing. I'm trying to film uh, some some kind of some different stuff that I'm doing in a few different ways. It's God Lord, it's a lot of work, but uh, but filming some new stuff there. We've got some stuff that we're doing on Instagram. Um, I actually have some. Um, we do have another platform that I don't talk a lot about a, a lot about, but I got some really cool content today. So there is another platform called VR, and it's V E E R dot TV. There's an app on your iPhone and on your Android device, but we're putting all of our virtual reality videos and pictures. And man, the VR pictures are super cool. Like I'm gonna, sh- I'm gonna show them to some of the team here in a few yeah. minutes. Uh, it's not very easy to watch them. You have to actually have a little, you don't have to have a full on headset to watch the, to look at the VR pictures. You can just slip on these little goggles over the top of them, but man, the detail and just rem- living, like looking back at that moment with your dog or with your family or whatever it is, but obviously our stuff's going to be dogs. It's just really kind of amazing to experience that. Um, and anybody that has a smartphone, if you have an iPhone or anything like that, you can definitely, uh, you can definitely watch that. So anyway, we will have a podcast coming out here eventually, guys. We're working on that. It's just uh, we've never done that, so it's something new for uh, for the whole team. But we definitely want to get that to you, so that way we can continue to help you with that. And hey, if if, if any of this stuff is useful, um, it would mean the world to me if you'd leave a review for us anywhere. If you did it on Google, if you did it on Facebook. If you did it uh, in the Alexa Skill Store, any of those places, we would really appreciate it. Well, I guess that's it for tonight, guys. Hey, if we're training with you this week, I'm looking forward to seeing you guys. If you're not training with us, but you're training your dog, thanks so much for using my content to help you raise a happy and reliable dog. So I guess that's it. And so, uh, Mandy, if you'll hit the button and stream, have a good night, guys. Take care. Bye. Bye. And.